chapter 12, we're bonding and structure. So the last two major topics that we cover on exam four is this thing called Lewis dot structures. We're going to do that. And then the very last thing is energy. Remember our definition of chemistry. Chemistry doesn't matter. It's properties, interactions, reactions, and energy changes. And so that and energy changes portion is the very last thing that we're going to cover. But before that, Lewis dot structures. And this is a little bit of digressing. And by digressing, I mean we're going to go back and look at how individual atoms are put back together. So, so far we started out learning what an atom was, and then we combined atoms. You learned how to make molecules from it, and then molecules, you learned the seven types of equations, and then once you did the seven types of equations, you learned how to do stoichiometry calculations. So now what we're going to do, though, is we're going to take kind of a... And then the next thing you're going to do is take those, those uh, calculations, and you're going to do energy calculations. And that's essentially the progression the flow diagram of this entire course. So this is kind of a little side trick, a little side trip here, that we're going to kind of step back and look at what, and consider what individual atoms, strike that, what individual molecules look like at the three-dimensional level. And of course that's important because it determines what's going to react with what and how fast they're going to react and all of that stuff. It's beyond what you need to know, but what you do need to know is, what a molecule looks like in three-dimensional space. What does water look like? Is that two H's? Is it like a like a like a line, like a pole, or is it shaped like a boomerang, or is it or is it L-shaped? I mean, how is those two H's and that O? How are they configured? That matters a whole lot. It influences chemical properties and reactivity, and that's the whole punchline of chemistry. So, look at this as kind of a step back. And, uh, and the first thing I just want to mention is there's a cascade that I've kind of invented. I think this, is, this diagram is going to be somewhere in your Blackboard stuff that I've posted. But this is a really good 30,000 foot view of what's going to, to many people, be extremely confusing when it comes to the lab. And I can see we've only got five people here, so... Uh, I don't know. So if they don't get it, they won't get it. So let me tell you what's going to happen. We're going to start with a formula. There's going to be this thing that I call a NASA table, and, and, and you'll see why later. And it's a little calculation that you can do that will allow you to then figure out the Lewis dot structure. And once you know the Lewis dot structure, which is a two-dimensional drawing of a molecule, you can then do something and you can figure out what its electronic geometry, how the electrons are arranged in three-dimensional space. And then you can do another little trick and you can figure out how the molecule as a whole, not just the electrons, but the whole molecule. Work. And then you can do another trick and you can figure out if it's polar or not. And that's what we're going to do. That's going to take up about, oh, let's see, of chapter 12, that's at least half of it. And, and because there's only two big topics, so... About a quarter of the next exam, I will say, will we'll, we'll be in this. And then I would say probably a good 10% of the final exam will probably be on this because we're going to spend a lot of time on it. And this is really confusing if you look at this as six different pieces. But if you, if you take all this stuff, and there's a ton of information I'm going to give you how to do this, it's really difficult unless you realize it's a cascade and it flows. You determine one thing from the information you got in the previous, and you determine that from the information you got previous. So if you don't understand any one of these steps, you can't work any of them past it. But the key thing at this point is just to realize they're all inextricably linked, and I'm going to take you through that cascade uh, in, in the lab and through one or two of the part of one of the lectures real quickly. Okay. So don't miss lab because that's where we're going to start. This week we're going to kind of cover this much in the lab. And then next week we're going to cover uh, more of it. Okay. Right. And your homework is going to have you go all the way down to, I think, this part here. So that's kind of where the lab's at. So the lab is great practice for the next exam. Okay. Just real quickly. A couple of things that you do know so you can bridge it with what you've learned in the past. Okay, we already discussed the seven reaction types. 
And you know that we I categorize those in two general classes. You either have ionic reactions or you had redox reactions. And during that time, I told you, if you just look at your reactants and you, and you want to guess which one of these, if you name the reactants as type 1 or type 2 compounds, you probably have an ionic reaction. And if you named your reactants as type 3, you probably had a redox reaction. And so I was bridging them together, uh, linking the information from two different chapters. And this is really slow. I might bog down a little bit here with this. I am trying to record this, too. I'm not saying I'm going to post it. So people who don't show up for the lecture, they may or may not ever get, they're going to have to probably get it on their own. Right. Okay. But that's their issue. <laughs> that's not your issue. Right. Okay. Bond type. If you look at this, uh, I want to just keep relating these because basically chemistry breaks down into just two blocks, ionic things and covalent things. So bond type. Ionic reactions are undergo by materials that are put together with ionic bonds. Redox reactions are typically the reaction of things that are put together with what's called a covalent bond. Well, what's the difference? Well, let's look at how the bonds are made up. For ionic materials, the bonds are electrostatic. What does that mean? It means they're held together by opposite charge. Sodium chloride is what? The Na is positive and the Cl is minus and opposite charges. So really, if you would, this thing right here is that opposite charge deal. And I'm trying to write with a mouse and it's not going to work very well. Okay. Yes. And how about the other one? Well, that's shared electrons. What does that mean? Well, that's what this chapter is all about. So it's taken this far to get you to understand there's two different categories, but we've never talked about what holds a covalent bond together. We just said these kind of bonds, ionic, are held together by opposite charge, but I never told you what holds the type 3 molecule together. And what it is, is it's called shared electrons. So here's the first thing you need to know. Ionic materials are held together by ionic bonds, and each bond is made up of opposite charge particles. Covalent materials are held together with covalent bonds, and those bonds are made up because the different atoms share the electrons. Okay? So, for example, we might have sodium chloride here that's held together with opposite charges. Oh, this is so rough, but I'm going to do it. Okay. But how about HCl? What holds that together? Well, it's easy. We can't draw HCl. We could draw HCl like this. And what happens is this represents two electrons. And kind of a funny thing happens. See, these are held together with opposite charges. What happens is hydrogen uses these two electrons, but chlorine also uses these two electrons. And you can see there's an overlap there. That's where they share. And this is what holds them together. They're sharing something. Each atom is hanging on to the same two electrons, and that holds them together. So this is what we mean with electron sharing, and this is what we mean by electrostatic charge. Two entirely different forces. The good news is this is, a, this is the only two general types there are. There's only two general types of reactions, and redox and covalent shared electrons in type 3 are all fall into this category. And the other one is ionic, and that's all those types of materials. Okay, now that you see that, here it is written out a lot more cleanly. What holds sodium chloride together? Electrostatic bonds, and they're ionic. The, another example of covalent molecule is water. So there's water, H2O. What holds it together? Shared electrons. What's sharing? Well, the oxygen is sharing one pair of electrons with one hydrogen, and it's sharing another pair of electrons with another one. 
So they're sharing here, they're not sharing here. Okay, as a quick aside, some compounds can have both. All right, for example, and you know what you should recognize. Uh, this as sodium sulfate, you can name that. So part of this, the sodium is held on to the sulfate anion by ionic bonds, but the sulfate itself, the SO4 itself, is held together by covalent bonds. Okay, so let's look. Bonds, force, energy, and shape. So let's look at these. You know all molecules are held together by bonds, and now you know there's two flavors. There's ionic and there's covalent. Again, the focus of this chapter is covalent. So we could put this, we could put this wording. Ethane plus air goes to carbon dioxide plus water. Word speak, you know that from your seven types of reactions. You recognize this is what was a redox reaction, and you recognize it as a combustion reaction. Why? Because oxygen reacted with something to give you the oxide of that. Okay, so let's now balance this chemical equation, and that looks like the second one. And you know how to do that. If I gave you those formulas, you could balance it. But what I want to do is break it down just a little bit more and show you all of the individual bonds. What holds this thing together? What holds this thing together is two carbon-carbon bonds and six carbon hydrogen. So you've got different bonds here. And what's oxygen look like? Well, oxygen looks like a double bond O, and there's seven of them. So what I'm doing is I'm writing this out by showing you the individual bonds. And when you do a chemical reaction, what you do is you break these bonds and you make new bonds, and that's really all a chemical reaction is. So that's all you've done. So let's see if I could actually break these. So you can see if we've got a bunch of CHs, what you've done is you've taken and broken these into a bunch of Cs. Yes, so you break this bond. You're going to get a bunch of Cs. And you break these, you're going to get what? A uh, total of four Cs and 12 Hs. Yes, so I could write all those H's over there. And then I could break these down into a whole bunch of O's. You're breaking the bonds. And then what are you doing over here? You're just remaking them. And so let me switch colors. And what happens is two of these, one oxygen grabs two of those. And then the next oxygen grabs two more. And then the next oxygen grabs two more. And you can see the water is forming. And then you're going to have some leftovers. And then one of these, one of these will grab one of those and make, a, make another bond. And so this is all a chemical reaction is. It's where you break a bunch of bonds and you break this back into atoms. And then the atoms shuffle around and recombine. Just so you know, that's why we care about these bonds. That's why we care about how they're how they're put together. Is because to do a chemical reaction, you have to take all your Lego blocks. You've got to break them apart into individual Lego blocks. Each of these molecules is something that was built from Lego blocks. So all a chemical reaction is is you break those Lego things down into individual blocks, and then you reform the blocks to make new shapes. And that's not a bad analogy. Okay, let's see. Do I want to go into this? Yeah, I guess that, since it slides up here. Okay, so this is that cascade I showed you earlier. Yes, I had it cascading down here. And I was trying to show you that like water running down a waterfall, uh, what comes from one goes to the next and what comes from one feeds the next and then that one feeds the one below it. Okay, so here that is in linear form. The thing I want to do is talk, just tell you a little bit about why we wind up at polarity. What's with polarity? Okay, polarity is just what you mean. You've heard of people being bipolar. What does that mean? They're extremely happy or extremely sad. A, a battery is, is, is polar. It's got a positive end and a negative end. So polar designates something that's unequal, that's kind of lopsided. So a polar molecule means if, if a covalent compound is sharing 
Do they share it equally? And you're going to find out not. Maybe you have a, a compound AB. And this is a covalent bond, which means they're sharing this. Well, guess what? This might take a big piece of the pie, and this one might take just a little bitty. So they're not sharing equally. Or maybe A takes most of the electrons and B doesn't get much. So even though they're sharing two electrons, they don't share it necessarily equally. And you can think of it like these two going after a pie. You might share a pie, but one of them might take three quarters of it and one of them might only take a quarter of it. Or one of them might take 90% and the other one only takes, uh, and the other one only takes, you know, five or 10%. So they may not share equally. If they don't share equally, it's called polar. That's where the polarity comes from. So in other words, I kind of look at it as lopsidedness. So what's polarity? It's how is the, is the electron sharing lopsided or not? And you'll see later why that's important. Okay, so here we go. Right, so what I'm doing is I'm going overview and giving you some concepts. So now, right now, we're in the subject of polarity. Remember, I'm going to show you in the lab how you determine whether something is polar or not. What I'm going to tell you in this lecture part is what polarity means. So there will be two types of, possibly two types of questions on a test. One of them will be asking you to calculate the polarity. That would be a calculation type of problem. The other one will be a concept problem asking you what it means.